Uh, our next speaker is to really, just for me, it feels hope that there's somebody like Reverend Dr. Byron Benton here in our community here in Charleston. Uh, he serves as the senior pastor of Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church located here in North Charleston. Uh, he's a native of Greensboro, North Carolina. He's a proud graduate of North Carolina A&T University. He completed his Master of Divinity degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and he has a PhD in Marriage and Family Therapy from Eastern University. Uh, we all know that he's passionate about empowering individuals and families and communities to live spiritually, mentally, and healthy and physically healthy lives. He serves as co-president of Charleston Area Justice Ministry, and he's a member of the board of directors for the Low Country Food Bank and the African American Chamber Fund. We're incredibly honored to have him join us today. Please give a warm welcome for Reverend Dr. Byron Benton. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Good morning. How are you doing today? Great. It is good to see you. And I want to express my appreciation to all those who have worked very hard to put on this conference year after year. Can we give each of them a hand, David and his team? And to you, uh, my co-laborers in this mental health journey, making a better place for all to live. Give yourselves a big applause. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize biasly who I feel is the best church to pastor, Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, as I... We are blessed to have over 30 licensed clinicians in our congregation. And they help me to be a better preacher and to serve God's people better. Today we're talking about family dynamics, personal connection, and meaning making. And I'd actually like to begin with a story. A story that took place on last Sunday. I had journeyed up to Durham, North Carolina where I presented in a men's conference over the weekend and ministered on Sunday morning. And afterwards, we went out to eat. And I had spent about seven years in a triangle, so there was a particular restaurant that I could not wait to go back to that I missed. We went, and we were meeting other colleagues and friends there. And I got out of the car, and we began to make our way to the restaurant. It was incredibly busy. It took us a while to even find a park. And there was a woman sitting on a bench, and she was crying. I saw her out of the corner of my eye, and we began to make our way past her. And after we passed by, I turned to my company and inquired with them, did you see what I saw? Was there a woman crying on the bench in public where there's plenty of foot traffic? And they confirmed with me that's exactly what they saw as well. So I told them, Go ahead into the restaurant. We know there's a wait anyway. I'll meet you in there. I doubled back to go and check on this woman. As I got nearer to her, I could recognize that she was a white woman wearing a colorful flower dress. She was looking down at the ground, and she was quickly wiping her tears as she sobbed. I stopped about six feet from her. And because she was so caught up in her moment, I don't think she even noticed that I was approaching, or maybe she was just used to people passing her by. And I said to her, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you, but are you okay? She looked up, and our eyes connected. And to my surprise, she gave a pleasant smile. And she said, that's so sweet. I'm okay. And I looked back at her again, and I said to her, are you sure? And her smile got even bigger, and she said, yes, I'm okay. And I said to her after that, 
Well, may God's peace be with you. And she said, thank you. And I turned and went my way. I kept an eye on her as I went into the restaurant, and I noticed that she had gathered her strength to stand. She did not seem to be weeping anymore, and she went on her way as well. I began to think about how many people possibly walked past her on that day. I thought about if I was the only one that stopped. And then it dawned on me what caring means for a person to be crying out in public where there are plenty of people where she knows are going to pass by means, even if it's subconsciously, she wanted to be seen. She needed somebody to see her, to show that they cared. And she did not need everybody to care because you may not have the bandwidth to care well on a day. And when that is the case, and each of us fall ourselves in to that predicament, it's best if we retreat and reclaim that strength. She did not need everybody to stop. She just needed one person to stop. It did not matter that they did not look the same, that we would not appear to be the same gender or anything of that nature, because when it comes to caring, there is absolutely nothing more powerful than caring for our fellow human beings. And yesterday, amen. Sunday just happened to be my day. And other days is your day. So today we're going to talk about a little bit about the importance of introducing religious vernacular where appropriate within the therapeutic setting. We're going to define religion. We're going to, within that setting. And then I'm going to give examples of the integration, the interweaving of such. In, integrated religious vernacular into therapeutic sessions can be a very powerful tool. And what we found out is during the 20th century when so many of our therapeutic models were being developed and implemented that they were being done so with a bias. You see, there was not really any clinical research being done to refute or affirm whether or not religious vernacular and spirituality could be welcomed into the therapeutic setting because there was a bias by those who were most influential in mental health. And the bias was that it should not be there. The bias was that it was neurosis. The bias was you religious folk crazy. But then as we entered into the latter 20th century, particularly the last decade, and then moving forward, we found out through research that there's actually evidence that it can be quite beneficial. Before we jump into that, let's talk about what they used in order to measure it. It's important to note that they did not use the term spirituality because it's difficult to measure spirituality. It was too varying. So what they decided to do is say we're going to measure it based on religion. Well, what does that mean? A set of beliefs and practices that are shared by a group of people. It also means that based on the belief it can be a, about a higher transcendent power and often involves rituals, ceremonies, and traditions. It includes beliefs in spirits, angels, demons, and often beliefs about afterlife, life after this life and rules that govern our behavior here on earth. Research, like what was released at Cambridge University in 2020, exhaustedly reviewing all the other research done over the previous 20 to 10 years, decade really. And what it found out can be summarized in this quote. Although there is little doubt that religion can be pathological and at times is used in unhealthy ways, the increasing volume of systemic quantitative research now available indicates that the days when every form of religion was automatically considered pathological or neurotic should be over. Another quote from that same publication, patient-centered care that takes into consideration patients, cultural, and religious background is increasingly becoming a standard for good clinical practice. 
what this means from my hermeneutical lens as a Christian Baptist minister is that if I walk with Jesus outside of the therapeutic session, I should be able to invite him in with me as well. And here's what's even more dangerous about it. If we don't do that, it can actually be harmful to the psyche of individuals. If there's not a space where we can both worship and meet with a clinician, where I can have a pastor or a rabbi or a imam and a clinician, then actually we can do great harm to those that we are called to care for. Dr. Wade Nobles highlights this. Professor Emeritus of Africana Studies and Black Psychology at San Francisco State University. He's also the co-founder of the Association of Black Psychologists. He suggests this, that for those who are descendants of West Africa, pre-slavery West Africa, that the psyche, and you'll hear me interject psyche and soul synonymously because in the New Testament in the Greek, the word soul in the Greek is psyche, and literally where we get the word psyche. And so you'll hear me introduce and interject that language, and it's synonymous for me based on my understanding and background and faith. But what Wade Noble says is that when you look at most of the languages in West Africa, pre-slavery, that there was not even a word for religion. The reason why there was no word for religion is because it was thought to just be a part of who you were. Therefore, you could not even parse it out, divide it to create a word for it. It was a part of your being. To try and compartmentalize it, to try and separate it, was then detrimental to the psyche of the one that you're working with. Because religion was being. Wade Nobles also says that there was distrust within the African-American community because of oppression and because of so many of the therapeutic models emanating from a Eurocentric standpoint that worked from an ontology of individualism instead of an ontology of connection. Because what Wade Noble said was in West Africa that it was about collective conscious. You've heard the term, many of us, I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. This was a part of an understanding that despite the many differences found within the West African cultures, that there was this belief in an anthropomorphic ontological philosophy that what I do needs to impact everything else I'm connected to in a positive way. And if you don't take into account everything else I'm connected to, and you just work with me, that will be harmful. Narrative therapy and other practices were developed from finding this out. Narrative therapy, of course, developed in Australia when clinicians were working with the aborigines and realized they could not help them unless they took into account the broader social constructs of their oppression. They could work all day with them as individuals, but if they did not deal with what was going on that they're connected to, healing would not really be possible. And so everything works in harmony, and to destroy a part means to destroy the whole. This organizationally manifested in the African concept of kinship, where we are all family, where we are all connected. And so there's room. Oh, pressing the wrong button. There we go. And so there's room for this language to be in concert with one another for the language that is authentic to my journey with God, to also be authentic to the concepts of different practices in therapy. And I tried to put as many up here as possible so that every clinician would see themselves <laughs> on this slide. Before we jump further though, sometimes I use metaphors because it helps me to understand this concept more deeply. And so as we begin now to shift and look at text and unpack it from a clinical lens, I want to invite you to see humanity as a tapestry. Just as a tapestry is created by weaving various threads into harmonious holes, our lives are enriched by the complex web of relationships we establish with each other. 
I believe the use of tapestry as a metaphor to the human condition effectively demonstrates how our empathetic interactions and shared experiences contribute to the beauty and resilience of life. Without all the binding of the many threads together, it is impossible to see or understand the design of the tapestry. At the heart of a tapestry lies the interweaving of different threads, each distinct in color, texture, and purpose. Similarly, human connections are formed by individuals who come from diverse backgrounds, possess unique qualities, and hold their own aspirations. In my tradition, we'd say it like this, there's one body, but many parts. Often when speaking with families, they are amazed at how they have the same children growing up in the same household, but they are so different. Different personalities, they act a different way. My dad, I remember saying that I came out as the baby and I was nothing like my siblings. A tapestry gains strength by the durability from the tight bond of the interconnected threads. Similarly, the human connection thrives when individuals do the hard work of caring, becoming vulnerable, expressing empathy, and providing support for one another. Like the threads of a tapestry, we rely on each other to face challenges, celebrate triumphs, and weather the storms of life. A tapestry is created by the repetitious weaving of horizontal threads called weft, over and under vertical threads, the warp. The wefts are then squished or tamped down, binding them close together. In the process, the vertical threads are completely hidden from view. Through visible, though visible to the naked eye in the finished product, the, reps, the warps can no longer be seen. However, before the tamping process, the squeezing and the binding, you can very much see. The warps are still visible in the threads as they are developed, but not once they're connected. And here's what I want to submit to you if you are like me and you care in some kind of way for the souls of others. And I promise you, this won't be the worst thing you've ever been called. You are a warp. The fabrics of society do not come together without the work that you do. But you will not fully be appreciated or seen for it because there's no way anybody can. They only see the finished product. They don't see what goes together in the tamping down. They don't see how much it hurts to care sometimes. And they don't see the struggle that you go through in learning how to care more. But when we care for the soul of another, you're a warp in the tapestry. And all of us at different times will play different threads, but that's a part of it. Are you ready to jump into the text? Five people are ready today. <laughs> are you ready to jump into the text? Yeah. All right, let's do it. It's Friday. Let's have some fun. Let's go to a very familiar text that is common among all major three faiths within the world. Genesis 1 and 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and that it was good. We skip down to verse 31, it says, God saw all God had made, and it was very good. We have an affirmation that comes from God over all that is when there was nothing or no one else to affirm it. And look at the language. God saw, and then God affirmed. There's a saying that I learned from reading Dr. Joy Lira Dugray's book, Post Traumatic Slavery Syndrome, that she experienced in South Africa that young men say to each other when they greet one another the phrase, I see you. 
There's something within us that desires and has a need to be seen and then affirmed. If you try to affirm me without seeing me, then I don't really believe in that affirmation. Because how can you say something's good about me when you're not even looking at it? Think of the child trying to get your attention on that picture that he's drawn. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it. And you're so busy that you just say, oh, it's good. Well, that may work at a certain age. But at some point, that child goes, you're not looking. <laughs> and they want you to see the work before you affirm the work. There's something about feeling accepted when I know you see me and you say an affirmation to me. We see this throughout text. Even when woman is created, the text says that God brings woman to man and then man affirms bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I'll name her woman for she was made from me. Now this is far deeper than gender and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we see is the first thing is an affirmation. For those of us who are Christian, we see this also when Jesus is baptized in the, in the river Jordan. By John. Says the Lord spoke, Matthew 3, 16. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This goes into our core longings. And this is going to sound very atlerian for those of us who are therapists and systems therapists and, and operating in that mind frame. We have, when you see in this creation narrative, a need to belong. So God created man in God's own image and the image God created him, male and female, God created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. I would suffice to say, it makes you feel like you belong, if that's your experience. When God literally forms you, and then breathes life into you with the Ruha breath, God giving of God's self in order to create life, that is a sense of belonging. There was nothing that Adam and Eve had to do in order to accomplish belonging. God saw and said, you belong. You're accepted just the way you are. We see this also in the New Testament nar narrative where we claim that we are adopted into the family of God. Well, why is that so significant? It's significant because we do not get to choose birth families. We inherit that. And whatever the family dynamics are, we are a byproduct or impacted in that by some way. But the concept of adoption means that you're chosen. That I see you and I accept you just the way you are. You don't have to perform. You don't need extra credentials. You don't have to do a particular dance. You are celebrated and accepted. That's belonging. It's when we have a deep feeling within ourselves that we are welcomed and celebrated in an integral part of a larger community, a larger family. That's belonging. Somebody say, I belong. I belong. That sounds great. Another core longing is significance. We have a deep need to feel significant. I need to know that I matter. That what I do matters. That I can make a contribution that is important to those that I am connected to. What I have to offer is significant. When a person feels insignificant, it can cause feelings of worthlessness. We become overly critical, possibly, of ourselves. This person may avoid challenges, may withdraw, and refuse to engage in relationships because 
is a fear of rejection or being criticized. Becoming more and more socially isolated. They may neglect in self-care. It's hard to generate energy to care for self when you feel insignificant. When you start hearing things like Black Lives Matter, that's coming back from a feeling of feeling insignificant. It's feeling like I don't matter. And we'll talk about where this goes and comes from a little bit later. And consistently experiences in life cause both those that we serve, but if we're honest, all of us in some kind of shape, form, or way in life to experience moments of feeling insignificant. But it's a core longing. Somebody say, I'm significant. Another core longing here is power and autonomy, right? If I don't feel like I belong, I won't feel like I'm significant. But if I feel like I belong, now I can move to feel like I'm significant. And then that gives me a sense of power and autonomy. I need to know that I have power, that I can influence my life, that I am not restricted, that I am not a slave to life. That I have options, that I have choices. Psychologically, we function better when we feel we have choices. I had a professor in seminary who gave 12 assignments, 12 writing assignments, but you only had to do 10. You got to choose which 10 you did, and you got to choose which two you omitted. For some reason, psychologically, none of us really face the realization that we had to write 10 papers. We were so excited that we didn't have to do 12, and we got to choose which 10. I mean, we're meeting out the class. Yeah, I'm going to do that one. I'm going to do it. Oh, I'm going to skip that one. I think. Because the professor had given us a sense of power that most professors don't do. With most professors, there are no options. This is the syllabus. You will follow it. You will turn it in, or there's consequences. And maybe one may have a little grace. And if you go through something, they'd help you out. We need to feel that we have options. We have autonomy. This is what we see in this text. They have power. Go. They were blessed. They were told to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. They, they were told what to do and what not to do, but they were not forced to do anything. They had the power to choose. If I feel powerless, if I feel like I have no choice, if I feel I have no say-so over my life and decisions that impact my life, then where do I go and what do I do? So much of the violence and things that we see, I believe, is a direct, direct result of A sense of powerlessness. So much of the rioting and other things is inspired by those who feel they have no power for whatever reason. Another core longing is safety and security. We have a desire and need to feel safe. Physically, emotionally, spiritually safe. I need to know this is safe enough to where I can even make mistakes. They are in a really neat situation, aren't they? Adam and Eve are here, and they don't have to worry about hurricanes. They don't have to worry about weapons of mass destruction. They don't have to worry about gun violence. They don't have to worry about injustice. They don't have to worry about any kind of bigotry. Life is good. They don't even have to worry at this point about sickness. Everything right now is about having a safe space. And when we feel that we belong, that we are significant, that we have power, and that we are safe and secure, now I can feel love. Now I can experience the comfort of love. If you make me feel like I don't belong, but you say you love me, 
Those send competing and conflicting messages. If you say you love me, but, uh oh, they're getting me right. If you say that you love me, but there's no safety, then that does not compute with love. Let's jump on this some more. We have the need to experience this, but hear me, there's power in the affirming of it. Let's try it for a moment. In my tradition, we do call and response. So I'm going to say it, and I want to invite you to say it in response to what I say, mirror exactly what I say. Are you ready? Say, I belong. I, belong. I am significant. I have power. I am safe. I am loved. Sit in that for a moment. Now, for those that are okay with this, I want to invite you to do it one more time, but do it a different way if you're comfortable. Nobody's forcing you. have free autonomy to engage in this as much as you desire. But if you feel comfortable doing it, I want to invite you to put your hand on your chest right where your heart is. And to take a deep breath, and as you exhale, to close your eyes, if you're willing and able. And let's try it again. I belong. I am significant. I have power. I am safe. I am loved. Amen. When I do this at different conferences, and I encourage you to do this with those that you serve and walk with, we then go back and spend time in each one. Which one felt different than another? Which one was harder to believe than another? How did you feel in each one? And we introduced those beautiful feeling wheels that I know that you're familiar with. And we point that out. We begin to explore then when was the first time that you felt significant and when's the first time you felt insignificant. And we begin to chart and invite God into that healing process. Now, how many of you would say, even as you said that, there was something that you experienced? You may not be able to describe it or anything, but by a show of hands, there was just something. There was just something that you felt in some kind of way. Yeah. See all those hands. That's, that's the impact of the affirmation. But there is a bit of a problem in this text because... This affirmation and these core longings are not to just come from God. The Lord God said, it is not good that humanity, that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now let's unpack this. It is not good. Everything else was good up until this point. But what this text is saying is that these core longings cannot just be met by God. They must be met in the context of community by fellow human beings. In the text, when you look at the original Hebrew meaning, it means much more than marriage. It means much more than man or woman or gender. God is making a statement about human aloneness or complete solitude as being a problem. There must be comparable companionship. The word helper, a zair in the Hebrew, means a person who contributes to the fulfillment or furtherance of an effort or purpose. It is only used a couple times to refer to people. Other than that, that language is only used to refer to God in many times in military circumstances where God is defending people. 
So here's what it means. A way to look at this is that it means alone, not good, but community created by God with comparable companionship that will function in a way that fights for others to find fulfillment and purpose, that's good. What we are doing when we're meeting and you're meeting with those that you serve and care for, we could probably all, if we discussed it, come to the conclusion that we are trying to walk with them in a way that helps them find fulfillment and purpose. And that we are there to help facilitate that, journey with them in it, help them process through what is keeping them from finding it. We're fighting to help others discover fulfillment and purpose. And that fulfillment and purpose, from a theological standpoint, comes not just from deity or from God. It comes when that is coupled with community. And so it's not so much about I belong, I am significant, I have power, I am safe, and I am loved. It's about making sure someone else knows you belong. You are significant. You have power. You are safe. And I love you. So much of the work that we do is not just helping individuals experience this, but helping them to gain the capacity to where they can help others to feel it in their presence. Because if I am the only one that feels like I belong, then we are not a community. If I am the only one that feels significant in my family, then we are not a healthy family. If I am the only one that feels as though I have some power in my congregation, then we're not a healthy congregation. If I am the only one in my practice that feels safe, things aren't going well. Because the hard work is how we create this environment for others. And I'm sending a conflicted message. If I'm sending I love you and you don't belong. This concept of love from both a biblical and a clinical standpoint really hold within them intimacy and empathy. And I'm going to move quickly through this part. Intimacy, commonality, sharing, and security. I love Dr. Wong's definition. Here's how he defines it. An emotional state in which two persons or a group have a sense of commonality, of sharing, and security. They shared. The whole world was there for Adam and Eve to share and engage in, right? And in that sharing, they had to have security. Furthermore, the feeling of acceptance fuels this emotional state, thereby allowing a person to engage in self-disclosure, trust, and healthy communication. I need to feel like I can be naked and not ashamed. That I can self-disclose and still find acceptance. That I can self-disclose and not feel shamed. Growing up, a common phrase was shame on you. And how many spaces in life will people go through where shame is placed on them? They are shamed. I can self-disclose and find acceptance. I can uncover and trust that you will still be present with me. Empathy is a complex capability enabling individuals to understand and feel the emotional states of others, resulting in compassionate behavior. Empathy requires cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and moral capacities to understand and respond to someone else's suffering. Can I unpack this a bit from my hermeneutical lens? From, from, from my hermeneutical lens, this 
is embodied in the Christian interpretation of Jesus Christ. Theologian Karl Barth says this, 20th century German theologian, that God condescended God's self. That means God lowered God's self in order to be wrapped in flesh. Here's why that's important. Before that moment, theologically, one would argue that, that God would only have an understanding from knowledge from knowing all things of human experience. But when there is a transcendence, then now there is true experience. In other words, it's one thing to kind of know what it's like to be me, but it's another thing to be me and then have empathy. This condescension then causes Jesus to weep because of grief, to have tears. This condescension allows him to experience what it's like to grow up in what we would call a blended family, where his father was not his biological daddy. This condescension is what caused him to experience poverty growing up in Nazareth, a place that was so bad that one said, can any good thing come from there? It's what we would call the hood. This condescension is what caused him to experience betrayal. It's what caused him to experience what it was like to have to go and seek asylum in Egypt because a king did not want him in that land. And so now I am operating with a theological lens in a therapeutic setting, welcoming a God who not only understands because of all knowing what it's like to be me, but can empathize because God was me and is me in practice and experience. That's a game changer. Because nothing makes me feel more seen than someone who's been where I've been and has found healing. We call that testimony. Nothing makes me feel better. Nothing gives me more hope than seeing someone who was wounded like I was wounded. Who has cried like I've cried. Who's been depressed like I've been depressed. Who's felt forsaken by God like I've felt forsaken by God. And even vocalized that in front of people. Nothing makes me feel more normal than my journey being normalized. That's empathy. And when we reach that place, when we have a healthy theological lens that allows ourselves to fully show up and disclose and find acceptance and find that there are others who will empathize with us, now we can have some peace. Shalom. Completeness. Soundness and welfare. Salam is the root. It means to make amends, to make whole or complete. Exodus 22.4 tells the story of a man who stole an ox from a neighbor, and he had to be restored by taking it back. God bless you. Salam alaikum. Essentially means well-being to you. May you be well. A state of wholeness or completeness without any deficiency or lack. That's peace. In the New Testament Greek, it's arene. Peace, quietness, rest, one. The root, ero, means to join together into a whole. It's the tapestry all over again. Unity through the bringing together of various parts to make one, to make amends. Healing happens in community. It happens individually. But in one way or another, for us to really have healing, it involves somebody else. Even surgeons typically can't provide, 
surgery on themselves. Someone else has to do it for them. They can't put themselves to sleep. Someone else has to engage in that. So we are bound together in community in this pursuit of peace. And so, friends, peace be with you. See, now I found out what your traditions are. There it is. That was. A, I got some Episcopalians, some Presbyterians, some. I think I heard a Methodist out there. I'm going to say peace be with you, and I want to invite you to say peace. How's that sound? Peace be with you. Ah, Beautiful. So what happened to this peace in the Garden of Eden? Didn't last. Adam and Eve went out of bounds. They used their power and autonomy to get exposed to something that was not a part of God's plan for their life. It was a Christian theologian father, Thomas Aquinas, who talked about the vices of curiosity, and he said this, the devices of curiosity of this in humanity, the desire to know what should not be known, one, and the desire to know something in the manner in which it should not be known. What he was saying is that there are certain things as humans we just never experience. To experience it changes us forever in a way that is harmful. To know war changes you forever. To know certain experiences automatically shifts your view of self, your view of others, and even can make it seem as if the world is working against you. Because we were just never designed to know that. They weren't supposed to know these trees. But they were supposed to know fruit in a way, and that's the second vice, to know something in a manner in which it should not be known. There's a right way and a wrong way to know almost anything. There's a right way to know an experienced family, but there's an unhealthy way to do that, isn't it? There's a good and healthy way to experience the clinical process. Therapy. But there's also an unhealthy way to experience that. There's a healthy way to experience faith. But there's also an unhealthy way to experience it. And to experience anything in the manner in which it should not be known creates brokenness within us, within our community, and within society. So let's talk a little bit about what it creates. It creates trauma. The definition, simple definition from the American Psychological Association, an emotional response to a terrible event. There's acute trauma, a single stressful, dangerous event. There's chronic trauma, secondary trauma. That's vicarious trauma. It didn't happen to me. But it happened in a way that causes me to experience it vicariously. So a good example of this, right, is from my own experience, is when we see people of color like George Floyd over and over looped on media, dying, if you identify in any way with that, it will traumatize you vicariously. It will traumatize your household. So in my household, conversations like this were happening between my wife and I. Honey, I don't want you to go out because I'm afraid something's going to happen to you because she's traumatized by seeing another black man on TV killed. So vicarious trauma happens to us even though we did not experience it directly because we identify with it. There's racial trauma, right? A real or perceived experience. It's important to note it's real or perceived. My perception is reality. So even if it's not real, if I perceive that it is, it's real to me. And I'm traumatized by it. I love the trauma theologian, systematic theologian, Dr. Shelley Rambo's quote here. Trauma can be identified as what does not get integrated in time and thus returns or remains obstructing one's ability to engage the world as one did before. That's trauma. Resma Menachem puts it this way, that it gets stuck in us and it's screaming to get out of us. And trauma then passes down transgenerationally 
and begins to become a systemic issue. I'd like to show you on layers how it impacts and then what's needed in order to address that. And then we'll move to close out the text. How's that sound? If you're still with me, say amen. amen. All right. I love this graphic. I, I, I took this concept from an organization that deals with social justice in Richmond, California called RISE. Most of us in this room probably can identify with this first layer. Individual and interpersonal. Embodiment and expression of distress through personal traumatic experiences, bullying, family systems, stressors, adverse childhood experiences, shame and blame, generational transmission. That's usually what a lot of us, right, are dealing with. And so there's pain. This is the individual. This is the interpersonal. This is the family therapy. This is the systems therapy. This is working with them. But there is a broader dynamic here that's fueling this. Community in place. Atmospheric distress that includes interpersonal, family, community violence. If I'm just exposed to this, this impacts me. I remember being a child to this day at a football game at James Benson Dudley Senior High School. My sister was in the band, and I remember watching Smith High School's football players run across the field. And I remember seeing their crowd disperse, and I remember my dad hovering over me because somebody had started shooting. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I was in third grade. I remember being in school and crying all of a sudden and having to be taken out to the counselor's office, and she asking me, what's wrong? And I felt like somebody was going to come after me. I was traumatized. I was not close enough to see him. I was not close enough. I was, had no connection in relationship to those who were shot or anything like that. But as a child, I was exposed to it. I was traumatized by it. And to this day, I remember it quite well. But I thank God for healing. Sexual exploitation, lack of safe passages and spaces. Nowhere safe for me. Underinvestment, over surveillance. That's what's happening in the community. And so as long as that's there, no matter how much work I'm doing with the individual, if community in place does not shift, we're just going to keep fueling this trauma. But that's being informed by something. Systems and institutions. This is the world beginning to work against Adam and Eve. Systemic subjugation. By in. Implementing policies and systems. Segregation is an example of it, right? Displacement, redlining, there's so many others, and this is not, you know, an exhaustive list in any one of these categories, but they're examples. Media assaults, no representation of who I am. I don't see me, and I don't feel seen. That's the systems and institution. What's taught, what's not taught. What's present, what's not present. What's demonized. And that's informed by history, legacy, and structure. Enslavement, genocide, economic exploitation, white supremacy, all these, right? So we can relate this to now and, 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 and hear me clearly. I'm, I'm not saying a political statement. I'm doing analysis of the social constructs and trauma, okay? So right now, there are heavy debates, right, in the history, legacy, and structure side on what will be taught where, right? That then informs the system and institutions that impacts the community in place, and then that goes down to the individual and the personal. Do you see that? That's just one example of how this trickles down, how this shifts down and impacts. So what do we do? On each area, there must be healing. 
and it works and impacts one another. Collective liberation by truth and grace. There's a scripture, John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In order for healing to happen, there must be an embracing of grace and truth. What that means is I've got to accept what the true reality is. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't pretend like it wasn't a thing. We definitely cannot make it seem like something like slavery was beneficial. Not a thing. If you want me to not feel seen or like I belong or like I'm significant, say something like that. Right? So there's got to be an acceptance of truth, that this is what it is. We've got to sin in it. It doesn't feel good, but grace is there too. That's unmerited. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. It's embracing the love and grace and accepting that this has been what it is, but we don't have to be defined by it, that there is life on the other side of it. As you're working with people, that's what you're helping them to see. You're helping them to confront some very difficult truths, but also this, to find that there is this grace on the other side of that truth that will turn new meaning into even the hard truth that they experienced. We call that purpose. Pulling purpose from disaster, purpose from pain, purpose from past, purpose from trauma. Uh, one of the ways we say in our tradition is God works everything for the good. Another thing that we say when we get real happy is that he'll do it all for the good of those who love him, but that God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around. All right, y'all better stop now. I'm not supposed to be preaching. When there is grace and truth, we can move to reconciliation. But if there's not both grace and truth, there will be no reconciliation. Because truth without grace, you'll just beat me up all day. Grace without truth will give a license for people to wrong and do wrong and never be held accountable. It must be both grace and truth. I love you, but I've also got to confront the reality that is you. <laughs> Systems and institutions lead with love and justice. By healing-centered and restorative practices, listening campaigns, collective care, powered sharing. For those who are really interested in doing something about this, I encourage you, nothing about us without us. What that means is that if you're going to help somebody, there needs to be somebody in the position of power who can empathize with the person you're trying to help, whatever that looks like. Because we can have noble intentions, but I cannot fully identify what it's like to be you with your cultural background, with your identity. I need someone else who can truly empathize with your journey, and we will share that power. That changes the system. That changes the institution. Community in place. Build beloved community by radical inquiry, popular uh, education and culture building, celebration and affirmation, healing spaces, arts and expressions. I'm often amazed when arts programs start getting cut. Watch out because there's no place to express base and power building. And this is a level where most of you are very familiar, right? Honor, resilience, and fortitude by listening and validating. That's what you do in your sessions, isn't it? Processing and in integrating and working through all these traumatic experiences. Family healing, right? Healing the, the family system. Tailored supports. Loving connections and structure. If we want to heal, it must be holistic. 
It must be about the full community. We can make an impact on each one of these levels, but we also have to realize, right, that each of us can only do but so much. And you have, one of the things I do when I talk with organizations and I present this, I say, know where you are, where you start, and where you stop in this. And then you partner with others who are doing the other work, knowing that it all works together. If you silo it, or if you think that you can do all this by yourself, you're going to grow weary in your well-doing because this is exhausting. But as God gives strength and as community comes together to address this, great things can happen. Let's move to close. I want to close with a story, a story that you're very familiar with. It's the story of Cain and Abel. It takes place, Genesis chapter 4. Starts with Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. It says, now Abel kept the flocks. He was a shepherd. Cain worked the soil, just like his dad. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruit. You know the story. Cain brought the fruits of the soil, and Abel brought one of his sheep, and God accepted the sheep but did not accept the grain offering. And Cain gets highly upset. Ultimately, this results in Cain experiencing rage, inviting his brother to go out, which must be something they customarily did, and murdering his brother. I grew up in Sunday school where Cain was often really demonized. But I want to lean in to Cain a little bit as we close. Is that all right? I understand now that you don't just snap like that. There had to be something in Cain that was triggered by his experience in worship that caused him to act out the way he did, to become jealous and envious and kill his brother. Why do you say that? Well, here's why I say that. Because his brother was a shepherd, which means he was used to defending the flock. Shepherds were, were pretty cunning. And especially in what would have been the world then, he would have had to be on alert also suggests that he had no reason to feel that he had to have his guard up. It was down. This is something they must have customarily have done. There's no reason why Abel thought Cain would kill him. The other thing I began to think about is what did it feel like to grow up in the household where Adam was your daddy and Eve was your mama? The last we saw of them... Was Adam churned from bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I name a woman for she was created from me, to you gave this woman to me, God, take her back. <laughs> Blaming her for this is all her fault. I was fine by myself. <laughs> Last we saw, Eve's voice was getting quieter and quieter in the text. As she was being blamed and then trying to blame the serpent, blame is just being shifted and passed along. Until we see this text where it's clear that Eve was very excited to have a son. Now, for my Bowenian folk in the house, this is classic triangulation. It's clear if she was experiencing rejection for Adam being blamed for everything, now I call her Eve for everything was created from her. All this fallen stuff, that's on her. If that is the case, then I would imagine that Eve does not feel as significant in like she belongs and like she has much power. And so now she's going to divert that and get that kind of attention, hopefully from her son. God has blessed me with a man child. Maybe he'll love me now. Maybe I'll be accepted. 
So Cain probably got a lot of attention until Abel was born. And then it became the classic first, second child competition. As my firstborn said when my wife was pregnant with our second, that's your baby, I'm daddy's baby. <laughs> Came out, if I picked up that baby, put May May down, pick me up. I experienced a life when it was all about me, and that made me feel significant. I don't know how to handle this life where there's another child. If blaming was the way this family dealt with stuff, and he was the firstborn, I can only imagine how much stuff he could never do right. I can only imagine how much acceptance he felt like he never got. There's nothing here to, to even talk about the interactions he had with his dad. The absence says a lot. So I can understand why there is rage in Cain. And here he is, working hard, and now in this moment, something else isn't good enough, and he's had enough. God confronts him like a good therapist. He asks a good question. Cain. Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Trying to help Cain process through his stuff. But Cain was not ready to have that conversation. God says something next, very interesting. He says, if you do well, will you not find acceptance? But if you do wrong, sin lies at the door and its desire is to have you. It doesn't say you'll be rejected. He says, something else is going to get in control of your heart. Something else is going to get in control of your behavior. Something else is going to take control of your life. And he said this, and you should rule over it. He's trying to convince Cain that, that this does not define you. You can do better than what this experience has been. This is not the end of the world, that this decision that you've made does not cause everything to blow up. But Cain wasn't having it, and Cain kills his brother. And now Cain realizes that punishment is going to come. Surely Cain will get what's deserving of him. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain is self-projecting onto God exactly what he believes God's going to do to him because I am deserving of this because my brother's blood is crying out from the streets. You have told me that already, God. You have told me that what I did is wrong. So now I'm awaiting what my consequences are. Surely the big smiter is going to smite me out of existence and punish me for the rest of the days of my life. And here it is in the text, but the Lord said not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city and he named it. He got a legacy. That looked different than his trauma? See, God's message never stopped. Cain, you're still not defined by this behavior. You still have significance. You still have power. You still belong. You're not defined by your lowest moment. You're not defined by your bank account. You're not defined by the size of your practice. You're not defined by the size of your church. You are still significant. And I still love you. You're marked. And here's what's interesting about that mark. That mark is the embodiment of grace and truth. That mark means every time Cain sees it, he's reminded of what he did. 
he's reminded of how that played out. He's reminded of the worst moment in which he took away a son from his family, broke his mother's heart, and no longer can play, talk, tweet, or text his brother. And others are reminded that, yep, that's him. But that mark also serves as a grace, a grace that says, despite all that, you still have a future, you still have hope, you still have healing, you still have wholeness, you still have life and can have it more abundantly. The bloodshed is still covered by grace. You will not get what you deserve. Because grace is unmerited. This is the significance on the Christian theology of Jesus still having his wounds. Because if it were me, and I had been bruised and battered and beat and hung like a common criminal to die, I would not want to have any visible resemblance of the trauma I've been through. And many of us go to churches where the saying is, I don't look like what I've been through, but we serve a Lord who looks exactly like the trauma he's gone through. Why is that? Because the disciples and even Thomas himself needed to see that there was life after trauma. And they needed to see that there was evidence that the scars were still there, but that the scars had been healed. And that, my friends, is the work that we do as a community realizing that we will always look in some kind of way exactly like what we've been through. But that does not mean that we can't heal or that it has not healed. Because as I close, like a preacher closes, God specializes in taking the pain of yesterday and turning it into purpose for today. God specializes in allowing me to see my wounds that only meant traumatic experiences yesterday to become testimony that gives life to other people today. God specializes in equipping me through the pain of my past and the trauma that I have been through to be all that God has called and created me to be to help bring healing systemically to all that we are going through. You, my brother, my sister, are a warp. And I want to tell you, as you go to do the great work that you're doing, may God's peace be with you. Amen.